Alright, so you scanned your network, you scanned your hosts, and you definitely found some vulnerabilities in there. And now it's time to fix them, which means that you've reached the remediation phase. Now the remediation phase is all about installing updates and patches and updating security policies, segmentation, everything that we've discussed in a previous video. But there are some things to keep in mind because remediation might not always go as you planned it due to a number of reasons. So let's see what exactly is going to stop us from updating everything, calling it a day and then going home. Well, probably the first issue that you're going to run into is when you're going to try to update legacy systems. That's old, very old hardware and software. So for example, if you think about Windows 7, right? Support for Windows 7 stopped some sometime around 13th of January 2020, which means that there are not going to be any new updates available for that operating system. So no matter how much you want to keep your systems up to date, if you're still running Windows 7, you're going to hit a wall. So what can you do about those items that you simply cannot update? Pause for a second and just think for yourselves. Ready? You have an idea? All right, let's see. Now, the first thing that you could do is to install something that's called a compensating control. If you remember, we've covered compensating control in a previous video already. Now, this is going to be something like installing a filtering device, a packet filtering device or a packet analysis device in front of that legacy system in order to protect it. Now, ideally, this device is also going to be capable of detecting some anomalies. So new attacks that might be addressed to some old vulnerabilities that haven't been discovered just yet, simply because nobody is still monitoring those systems and nobody's developing security updates for those. Second thing that you can do is to air gap that system or that network that hosts those vulnerable legacy systems. That basically means completely disconnecting them from the network or relying on some other method of inserting data, of injecting data into those systems, which doesn't require those systems to be constantly connected to a network or to the internet. That's air gapping. And finally, the third one, the favorite method of all the <laughs> vendors out there is to simply replace the system with a completely new one. Take it out of your network, retire it properly, and then replace it with a newer version, a one that's still supported, that still gets security updates, one that you can properly patch. Another source of problems when it comes to updating your systems is going to be about proprietary systems. Now, proprietary is just another word for custom hardware, or most of the time just custom software that might have been developed in-house by your own company or developed by some other company and then purchased by your company as a custom software. So it's not a commercial software that is widely available to multiple customers out there. It's something that was designed specifically for your environment. Now you can probably guess why this type of software is going to cause a lot of issues. If it was developed in-house, maybe the software development team that took care of that software doesn't exist anymore. If it was purchased from another company, then that company might have gone out of business or even your contract, your agreement with that company doesn't specify that they should provide any further updates. Or it can also happen that the software project was simply abandoned. Nobody is still working on it anymore by their parent company. So it's just a piece of software that was developed up to one point and then everybody went on doing something else. And of course, this is also not going to allow you to update that software because there are no updates to be found. And another technical issue when it comes to updating software is the problem of degrading functionality. This is a very important issue and it's often coupled with updating older and legacy systems and also relevant for proprietary software. And I can give you a ton of examples here. So if you want to update a software package on a server or an application, well, that system might need a reboot, a restart. Can you do it during the day? Should you do it during the night? Do you have a backup plan? Do you have a rollback plan just in case the update doesn't go as scheduled or as planned? Also, maybe during the update or the restart, the system has to go offline completely. Think about any redundancy or high availability or fault tolerance solutions that you might have in place. Think about, are they going to kick in? Is that going to affect 
the network as a whole? Is that going to affect the users, the functionality that they expect from the network? Also, what's going to happen when you bring the updated system back online, especially if now it's on a completely different software version? Is it going to kick back in and start working properly as it did before? Or is it going to cause some inconsistencies in your high availability setup? Now, all these problems are basically covered under the term of business process interruption. So anything that causes your business or your applications that your business relies on to stop working. And that's basically the number one reason why we usually plan for maintenance windows. We don't just go ahead and update the systems in the middle of the day. We need to have dedicated time in order to properly monitor what's happening during that update and see if everything is still working as expected after the update has been completed. Also on the chapter of degrading functionality, think about the situations where you are adding some features, some security features, for example, encryption, traffic encryption or data at rest encryption to an application that's running on a server that is very old and perhaps cannot handle the CPU cycles required to properly deliver the same application performance, but now using encrypted traffic. Remember a few years ago when if you didn't have the latest and the greatest iPhone, any new iOS update would slow down your phone just a little bit. Now, fortunately, this doesn't happen anymore. But if you have used an iPhone during the past 10 years, then you most certainly remember this issue. Another issue, this time on the software side of things. What if you have specific applications that are designed to work only with certain library versions? Now, certain versions of OpenSSL or certain versions of Python or Java. And maybe they were designed badly enough so that they don't work with any future versions of Python or Java or OpenSSL. So how do you update, for example, Java on such a system? Because, you know, Java publishes some security updates from time to time and you should probably install them. But what if installing those updates is going to break your application? What do you do then? Well, you simply don't update Java anymore and you're left with a security vulnerability that you have to think about mitigating it in a different way. Also, we have another problem with general patches and yes, Windows 10, I'm looking at you and actually you're not the only one here, but very often patches introduce additional bugs, even crash applications altogether. You can have a lot of new problems from simply installing a new update on an operating system. What's the solution to this? Well, fortunately we have one test those patches in a similar environment in an isolated environment or some kind of environment that resembles as close as possible your production environment just to see if everything is still working as you expect it to work. So make sure you approve any patches before deploying them to the rest of your servers or to the rest of your users inside of your company. And if you're saying that it's not always possible to have a test bed environment where you test all your patches before you deploy them. Yes, you're right. That's not always possible. Life is not fair. And unfortunately, there's one more showstopper. That's bureaucracy, red tape, approvals. So you get your scan reports, your vulnerabilities all neatly prioritized, you got the patches ready, the updates, everything that you need ready to implement right there. Employee of the month is your next title. And you go to the management. And you ask them, when can I start hitting the keyboard and making all these changes? And the answer is going to be something like, ha, where do you think you are? We have procedures here, my young Padawan. We have approval pipelines, requests, request approvals, decisions, decision approvals, signatures, documents to be signed, documentation to be approved and reviewed on the next board meeting. And a ton of people that have to approve these changes and each and every one of those people has to understand in his or her own limited language and level of technical expertise, why should this be approved? What are the risks, the costs? Who needs it? Why do you need it? Why do we need it? So basically, for better or for worse, it might not be as bad as I just described, but that's going to be the definition of change management. Or if you want, you can call it blame management or <laughs> blame distribution among all those people who agree to put their signatures on that change. But the bottom line here, and a very important bottom line here, especially for the exam, always remember that any kind of change to your infrastructure, to your network, to your systems, always have approval before performing it. Always have approval, written approval from the management. 
And finally we have MOUs and SLAs. And just like we did not have enough issues, now what the heck are these? Well, you have to consider, especially since we've just mentioned this, you have to consider that degrading the functionality of your network, of your systems, might not just, let's say, uh, create some discontent among your employees, but it might also impact some agreements that you have running with your partners, with your clients, uh, with your users. So if we do need to rely on some downtime where the systems are going to be down and unavailable, we need to coordinate that downtime with our partners, with our clients, so that you won't breach the contractual terms that you have pre-agreed with them. And it's not just about availability, but also there might be some contractual terms, some specific requests or requirements in those documents that prohibit you from implementing certain remediation actions. For example, if you if you need to perform a type of scan or a type of update to the latest version, you might find out that you are not allowed to do so because it says so in the contract or the SLA. So let's describe both of them actually because they, there are some slight differences between these two. Starting with the Memorandum of Understanding or the MOU. Now a Memorandum of Understanding is more like a gentleman's agreement. Right, It is a kind of an agreement. It's written in such a way so that it clearly describes who is responsible, what are the roles, who does what, what are the expectations that this and that has to be done, but it's not legally binding. So think of it as a gentleman's agreement, not something that has actual legal value. An MOU can actually be as simple as an email follow-up after a meeting. So we've decided to work together on something, on a project to implement something. Then you send an email and say, you know, following up on the, our discussion as or per our discussion, this is what we agreed. These are the responsible people. These are, these are going to be the tasks and these are going to be the deadlines. And secondly, we have SLAs or service level agreements. You probably have heard of these before because they are contractually and legally binding. So they actually specify what you need to be delivering and very importantly, how you will measure those deliverables. For example, you might have such an SLA agreed upon with your internet service provider at home or at work. So the internet service provider basically tells you that I commit to providing you 95% uptime and at least X or Y megabits per second of internet upload and or download. That's going to be a type of SLA. So what exactly does the company agree to provide and how it is measured? So guaranteed uptime and bandwidth are two types of metrics that are usually found in an SLA. Now, other types of metrics might be regarding availability, for example, for an online service, an online application, even a, a cloud provider, a response time for incidents, or for a central application, for hardware devices or for replaceable devices, you might have an SLA that specifies how quickly that component is going to be replaced by the vendor or how quickly a ticket, a support ticket is going to be assigned to a support engineer and ideally how quickly is going to be solved by the, uh, by the support department. One very important idea to remember for the exam is that SLAs have to be measurable and the way they are measured has to be explicitly specified in the SLA document. So don't forget about this. SLAs have to describe something that is measurable. And since it's contractually and legally binding, the reason why we're measuring this and we're specifying how to measure those deliverables or those services is because if the provider doesn't comply with those agreed upon service levels, then they can be held responsible legally and financially. All right, so for the exam, make sure you understand the risks that we are facing when we want to be always able to do so. Even if it's because the systems are too old, we're talking about legacy systems, it might be because we're talking about proprietary systems where the vendor has abandoned the product or doesn't support it anymore. It might be because you're running, uh, a, it might be because you're hitting a wall when it comes to red tape and approvals inside of the company. But nevertheless, try to remember at least some examples of each category here. The exam is most likely going to ask you about this. And also don't forget about the differences between MOUs and SLAs. 
Thank you so much for watching. I would greatly appreciate if you could like and subscribe because next time we're going to talk about change management. So see you on the next episode.